France is tra traditionally very well known to be a contentious uh, country. And just uh, to mention uh, a recent study made by uh, NAM, uh, a scholar was shown um, that the number of protests, uh, what kind of protest events during the 90s was the highest in France among the European <coughs> countries, very well heard uh, Germany and Spain. Very briefly, to give you a very uh, few figures about the Occupy movement in France, the most important demonstrations uh, between May to November 2011 gathered around three to 5,000 people in the streets in Paris, Lyon, and in other French cities, which has to be, com to be compared uh, with the huge demonstrations in Spain, of course, but also in uh, Lisbon, uh, Roma, New York, Berlin, and lots of, uh, of other cities. Not only the demonstrations were weak, but the occupations of public squares, uh, which were, as you know, one of the main uh, characteristics of the movement in other countries, uh, the occupations were almost inexistent. Um, several factors can explain this situation. From um, uh, a few words of methodology, I should say that my analysis is based on a qualitative approach and that I have focused uh, on the situation in Lyon and Paris. I made interviews with uh, Occupy activists and I, I also took into account the printed and electronic documents and information uh, uh, available from the scientific community but also from the press uh, in general. So why was the Occupy movement so weak in France? I will mention seven aspects. The first one is the, the political agenda. The Occupy movement has emerged in mid-2011 during the beginning of the French presidential campaign, at a time when lots of French citizens, especially on the left wing, were waiting for a new majority. And in this sense, their expectations and their hopes for more social justice could have been um, oriented, in a way, on the political uh, competition. And it is true that among the Socialist Party, the Front de Gauche, or even the Green, some politicians like uh, Arnaud Montebourg or Jean-Luc Mélenchon, for instance, were defending ideas relatively close to those of the Occupy movement. We should also keep in mind that the last two massive French, French social movements, one against the reform of the universities in uh, 2007, the order against the reform of the pension system in 2010 were unsuccessful. And it is very likely that some people were still disappointed and have preferred in 2011, so just a few months after, not to engage into a new mobilization. This is a kind of a Yashmanian uh, effect with cycles of collective engagement, engagement and private uh, withdrawal. So the political offer and the political agenda could have played a role in the weakness of the French Occupy movement. There is no doubt that almost all European countries have to face nowadays a deep economic crisis, but not at the same degree as George Ross has shown this morning. Here the very basic argument is to say that the economic crisis is, is less severe in France than in Spain or in Greece, and that it has, uh, uh, it could have a direct effect on the success of the Occupy movement. In particular, what is very specific to the French situation is the role of the diploma regarding the labor market. And until now, young people with a degree tend not to be unemployed, statistically of course, and it makes a huge difference with Spain and uh, generally southern European countries, where a significant number of young people after their graduate studies still do not find a job. And this is this uh, fringe of the population, young graduates without a job, 
who constituted the core part of the Occupy movement in, uh, in these countries. <coughs> in France, regarding social issues, the youth is split into two groups, at least since the last 30 years. One group is well educated, still relatively well integrated, whereas the other group is completely excluded economically, socially and politically. This last segment of the youth is the one who lives in the suburbs and who is active from time to time through riots. Riots are a very important phenomenon and take place very regularly in France, even if they are most of the time invisible in the public space. And the point is that the Occupy movement in France has been, total, has been totally unable to be rooted in, uh, in a suburbs, totally. And this situation, of course, is the result of a long process of uh, mar 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 marginalization and re re relegation of some territories, in which there is nowadays no trade unions, no political parties, no political activities, except riots, if you consider riots as a political activity, but this is uh, another story. What I, want, what I want to stress here is that you have had in France in 2011 two movements which were parallel. On the one hand, the Occupy movement, I would say a movement of white and relatively integrated people. On the other hand, rioters and more generally young people living in the suburbs, most of them with a migrant background and who are unemployed, completely excluded socially but also politically. The paradox is that the issues raised by the Occupy movement deal directly with the problems that people who live in the suburbs have to face, unemployment, social inequalities, but also claim for dignity, but they were not, not part of it. The Occupy movement in France has never been able to catch the attention of the media, at least at, least at the national level. One cool thing it is because the mobilization was modest and did not uh, reach a critical size. And this is true, but my interpretation is that it has also something to do with the fact that the Occupy movement had no leader, no spokesperson, and tend to refuse the logic of representation and delegation of power. Nobody has the capability to speak on behalf of the movement. The movement is considered as such as a collective entity. In France, as elsewhere, the Occupy movement is based on a strong criticism of the traditional political organizations and try not to reproduce this logic. <coughs> My hypothesis is that this way of doing um, went against the expectations of the media which traditionally like to, person, to personalize social movements and contention action. Another complementary explanation, which is well spread among the Occupy movement, but also among the literature on the media, is that the media tend to support dominant actors. But this is a question I would like to still to, to keep up. The policing of the movement. Because the French Occupy movement has never been a mass movement, has never been widely covered by the media, and has, has never had a large support of the public opinion, repression by the police was very efficient and was almost unnoticed. This is one of the reasons why occupations of public squares were so rare. They were made almost impossible, effective, except a few days in Paris and Bayonne in the South of France. And here the, con the contrast with the Spanish situation is obvious, since the number of people in Puerta del Sol was so huge and the context was so different with all the media not only from Spain but from all over the world following the event, that it was very risky for the police to evacuate the, the place. <coughs> As I said, from the beginning, the movement has been extremely critical regarding political uh, parties and uh, even civil society organizations, and I would say regarding all kinds of uh, organizations. The idea was really to be completely independent and autonomous, even from the extreme left. At the same time, the claims put forward by the French Occupy movement were very vague. 
It was against the finance for a better world, for more equality, for a share of resources all over the world. Very interesting and sensitive topics, but not very uh, result-oriented uh, issue, I would say. In countries where the mobilization was important, the claims were also general, but with a, a link, a kind of tradition, with more concrete objectives. For instance, employment and housing in Spain, anti-austerity <coughs> measures imposed by the international organization in Greece, even the financial system in the US. In France, this link between general, long-term issues and concrete, short-term claims was not really made. Who are the French uh, indignés? <laughs> Here yeah, I focus more on the uh, Occupy movement in Lyon. The mobilization was, uh, was at first based on a feeling of solidarity with the Spanish movement, and I think it is very important. In fact, the very first activists were young Spanish, Spanish, most of them being students, who wanted to show their solidarity with the Spanish movement. And it can explain the lack of rooting of the movement, either at the national and at the local level. Rapidly, a core group of around 30 people were involved, more or less on a daily basis, in the movement. Most of them were interested in uh, global issues, the grand cause, like humanitarian action, the right uh, for refugees, for immigrants, but also sustainable development or the fight against poverty in the world, etc. Their background is quite diverse, but basically they share the feeling that the world is too unequal. These people are generally young, less than 30 years old, but not all of them. They have an interest in lots of different public issues, as I said, and in this sense they are quite politic politicized, but not in the traditional and somewhat uh, restrictive uh, sense. Um, for instance, they never, absolutely never refer to the left-right cleavage. The libertarian and uh, uh, anarchist dimension of their action is quite important. They do not really believe usually in global ideology and they have a very modest or very pragmatic conception of politics, arguing that it is a very long process which is based first of all on the behavior of individuals and they count more on individuals than on organizations and I think that they perceive themselves as individuals and in this sense interviews were quite fascinating because it was a kind of a, a perfect illustration of what the literature on uh, contemporary forms of, co of collective action is about, is about the will to be part of a collective movement but at the same time the will to be free. Most of them are not really socially excluded even if a few uh, are homeless people, for instance, but many of them are students, uh, have a job, or at least a part-time job. They are relatively inexperienced in terms of political activities. I don't have enough time now to go into the de details, but just to give you an example, in Lyon, a very practical problem was to find a, a room or a place in which uh, they can uh, put all the stuff which were uh, useful for the demonstrations uh, and for the occupations, just, just because they have um, no uh, organizational support. They were also lacking networks and contacts with journalists and politicians, of course. And finally, um, most, uh, it was most uh, surprising for me, uh, they were uh, divided. Two groups can, roughly speaking, be identified more or less along the line of the logic of collective action versus connective action uh, that uh, Jackie Smith uh, put forward in a, in a, in a paper. <coughs> the first group is in favor of occupations and is largely inspired by the Wall Street movement. People who support this orientation have the feeling that they are in a way the real activists because they are in direct conflict with the police, because they are more or less permanently in the streets, and because they take uh, some uh, risk. Another group is more interested in the cognitive framing of the movement, the bu building of ideas and networks between people, and tend to concentrate more on uh, 
exchange face-to-face uh, -face or through social networks. So finally, even if the mobilization was rather weak in number, people were divided by different logic of action and priorities. Just a, a few words to, to conclude. To conclude, now the, the Occupy movement as such is dead uh, in France. Its weaknesses can be explained both by internal and external, external factors, so both in terms of resource mobilization and political opportunity structures. But it does not mean that the ideals of the Occupy movement did not spread through the French society. And the book, Indignez-vous, uh, which was written by Stéphane Essel, was really a bestseller with more than two millions of uh, sellings. Uh, but as a, as a contention action, the French Occupy movement was not Europe, were not able to develop. Irish case, but in many particularities, but also similarities of what we've seen exist in an awful lot of other countries. And I think in many ways, an awful lot of what um, Didier has just said about the French situation, um, surprisingly, um, I guess perhaps surprisingly, is, uh, is replicated in Ireland. And in, in some cases, in some uh, ways, it, it kind of goes back to what George Ross is warning about the dog that doesn't work, an expression he used. Um, situations where you kind of expect that there's revolt, kind of expected something really kind of major happens, but did nothing really uh, of any significance does, does come about. So what we kind of want to do is explain why, in the Irish case, this uh, really doesn't come about. Okay, so this is a picture we're showing here about one of the Occupy camps in in, um, in, um, in Galway, I think it is. But um, in Ireland, Occupy really took place all over the country, in all of the major cities, Northern Ireland and, and the Republic of Ireland, in Belfast and Derry or London Derry, in Galway, Limerick, Cork, uh, Waterford, Dublin, those are the main major cities for those of you who know the geography of, uh, of the country. And in a lot of ways, what happened in Ireland kind of replicated again what happened in, uh, in Philadelphia, in Pittsburgh, in, in, uh, in Madrid, in, in, uh, in Washington, and so on and so forth. What the Irish people were kind of showing, the people who participated in, in Occupy, they were showing basically anger, frustration about decreases in, uh, with significant decreases in the Irish case uh, of uh, income. For example, in my, my case, I'm a university lecturer, my income decreased 20% in the space of a few, uh, few, 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 few weeks, which is uh, pretty catastrophic if you're trying to raise a young family. But uh, I'm not to, to blame another lot of, another number of other people in Ireland who, uh, I guess, don't have a permanent job like I do. To, to uh, have even more catastrophic drops in their, in their income, so on and so forth. So drop of income, drops, significant drops for an awful lot of people in, in, uh, in living standards, and an increase in um, indebtedness, public indebtedness in the Irish case, but also phenomenal private indebtedness. So that's what a lot of the people were coming uh, together to complain about. But in some ways, I guess, what we have to question is the, um, is the impact of the Occupy movement in Ireland. I mean, was it really significant? And in some ways, what, what we're trying to argue is, it wasn't really. Uh, it existed, and in in, uh, in in some ways, I think I I, I stand to be corrected, but I think uh, in the case of Galway, we're going to talk about. In the case of Dublin, we're going to talk about. Um, Dublin lasted from um, I think it was October uh, 2011 until I think it was uh, January, February, March of 2012. So four, five, six months. And in the case of Galway, it was, went from October all the way until May, June of the following year. So it's a significantly long uh, uh, Occupy protest, uh, occupation of public space, way more than what I've seen in any other country, which is, from an Irish point of view, absolutely phenomenal. But was it really important? Um, and also, a kind of question can I ask is, in the Irish situation, I'll explain the context in a few minutes, so why uh, is it that what happened in Greece and Spain M15 uh, situation in Spain, you know, massive demonstrations and so on and so forth. Why didn't it happen in the Irish case again? Why didn't the dog? Why doesn't the dog, bark? Why doesn't the dog bark? Um, so it seems to us that there, in in, um, in in the Irish case, it was extremely weak level of mobilisation uh, at a time when one would expect there were extremely favourable social, economic, and maybe even political uh, reasons. Uh, the context was really favourable from social, ecological point of view, economic point of view, and also maybe political point of view. We really kind of attribute that to two factors. One are the internal characteristics of the movements, of where the people were involved in it, uh, the kind of strategies they put forward, 
and so on and so forth, how the movement developed, but also more type of um, cultural, political to cultural traits. What we think is really that there, there was a possibility that the, uh, uh, the activists, that the occupiers themselves, were either unwilling or perhaps even in incapable of interacting with the, the, the more prevalent um, Irish political culture. Um, so we kind of want to break the, the talk up into three parts, so, uh, social economic context, <coughs> uh, protests as such, and, um, and the case studies Galway and, uh, and, Galway, uh, Galway and, um, and, and Dublin. Okay, so very, very briefly, social economic context is kind of, um, I mean, I'm going back over territory that George Ross crossed, uh, a territory across this morning about the uh, development of the whole situation. But, but again, in the Irish case, it's kind of a different than what has happened in, in many other European countries. Ireland, some of you may or may not know, went through a long, long period of uh, economic lethargy. The fact that basically the 1920s independence all the way to the 1980s is basically a basket case in Europe. Low levels of economic development and so on and so forth. And by the 1990s, early 1990s, the whole situation got turned around very, very, very quickly. And uh, um, kind of the, the catchword Celtic Tiger came about in, in the early 1990s, all the way to early to mid 2000s, and we saw extremely high rate of economic development, economic performance, five, six, seven, ten percent um, average increase per year of uh, GDP, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the uh, Phenomenal, uh, the, the Celtic Tiger phenomenon was kind of based on new patterns of interaction states, civil society interactions. And one key factor in that was the partnership agreements. And partnership agreements were basically the state working hand to hand with trade unions to bring about peace, social peace, consensus, and so on and so forth. Mid 2000s, housing crisis came along there, a housing bubble came along there. And, but those who challenged, those few, um, people of the left or even the far left who dare challenge the um, overarching um, political philosophy, neoliberal political philosophy, were called by Prime Minister at the time left wing pinkos. Because basically they were really, really of a minority. Anyone who dared uh, dismiss them were called left wing pinkos. And the mass population basically didn't really care about uh, putting limits on uh, the square of spending and so on and so forth. 2008 came along there. We all know the situation in Europe, in, in the United States. Uh, but it infected Ireland perhaps much more so than in many other countries. The bubble burst, economic disaster. We find myself, I find myself losing 20% in overnight, <coughs> and the Irish economy just going down the basket, uh, going down the tube. An awful lot of my nieces and nephews in Ireland now are in New Zealand, in Australia, in Canada, anywhere else but in Ireland. The educated youth are anywhere else. Okay, so as a as, as, um, as, um, response, to the economic crisis, the state put in place austerity measures precipitated by the bailouts, which um, the bank bailouts, which our Irish government got in 2000. The Troika came in, the IMF, the uh, uh, Cent uh, European Central Bank, and so on and so forth, and imposed austerity measures on the, Irish, uh, on the Irish people. By 2008, they came about, by 2010, they were there, and you're still here. So the austerity packages basically meant increased taxation. Um, yeah, increased taxation, decreased public spending, a decrease in social welfare entitlements, so on and so forth. Well, classic austerity measures. Now, there were protests against these, um, these, um, these measures taken about since 2008 particularly, more, slightly more so since 2000. But protests really, a number of protests have come about, but some of them were carried out by trade union movement. An awful lot of those protests were carried out outside the trade union movement by civil society organizations by students protesting against increasing fees, by uh, senior citizens in, uh, protesting against their uh, decrease in their uh, subsidies, old age allowances, and so on and so forth. But the themes of many of these protests, organized protests within traditional type of protest modes and protest activities, and so on and so forth, were anti-austerity, against austerity measures being put in place. And also, recently, over the past year or two, um, as a way of uh, claiming uh, for the government to claim back um, economic, store, uh, economic sovereignty, which had been abandoned when the bailout measures came into place. But the key in this factor here is that there were no criticism of the system in place, or very, very, very little criticism of the system in place. I'll have to go kind of fast here, but one of the reasons for that is it really depends on the political culture in Ireland. 
and the, the effects of the political uh, culture in Ireland, the historical situation of political culture in Ireland. In many ways, we can say that Irish politics is really unique in Europe. Okay? That in, in the Irish context, there's a very, very, very limited, traditionally, now what I'm saying here is, I'm, I'm kind of um, 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 making some generalizations, because things are changing kind of quickly. Well, they have changed over the past 10 years or so, and they're still in the process of change. But in general, um, then the, the effects of class division have little impact, traditionally have, have little impact in, in, in Ireland. The overgetting question in Ireland has been the national question, whether we want to separate, are the Irish people want separation from the British um, state or not in 1922. And that has really pervaded politics over these past 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. Uh, so the, the key characteristics in the Irish case are traditionally, now this is changing slightly, but it, it still has a major, major impact on how politics is played out in Ireland, and protest politics in particular are played out in Ireland. There's been a low level of economic, social economic cleavages. There's been a phenomenal consensus on social and economic issues these past 50, 70, 80, 90 years old. There's been extremely stable volume and pattern of support for main political decisions, main political issues, and particularly in the 1980s, 1990s, a very, very, very strong support for neoliberal policies, policies being put in place. Very few challenges across the board. There's, there has been an extremely low level of electoral volatility, which meant that the two main parties, political parties, both of the right, central right or of the right, over these past 50, 70, 80 years, have basically adopted policies which have been largely supported by the Irish people. There's no left challengers as such. The Socialist Party in, in, uh, or Labour Party in Ireland has been, well, a power player in recent years, but really center of the right, or right of the center, um, arguably uh, right to the center. There's been clientelist relationships, there's been elite accommodation, and so on and so forth. Which means that the government over the past number of years has put into place conflicts avoidance strategies in order to placate possible Contestation has come in place. Now, when protests, when so government has put in place pragmatic approaches and so on and so forth. When protest has come about on key social and economic uh, issues in the past, and we are argue in the current situation, then protest has in many ways been routinized. Protest in many ways has been a way of leading to negotiation. Protests have been in overarchingly peaceful. It is the whole situation of the IRA and so on and so forth, but that's kind of it needs to be taken um, in another corner of uh, challenging political uh, systems in Ireland. So, routinization, non institution uh, a sensationalist form of protest. Uh, in, 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 in many ways, protest has been about not rocking the boat. Put your argument forward, but don't rock the boat. Accept things as they are. Uh, protest has been about sticking by the rules, and the rules is you don't rock the boat. And protest has also been about not being seen to be extremists, being seen to be part of the consensus, being seen to be part of the mainstream, being seen to be part of a way of bringing society forward and not, again, to rock the boat. Now, in this general context of the socioeconomic change, the crisis that we're facing now, but also the whole situation in our social culture, then the two uh, examples of the Occupy movement that we've, we've looked at, Galway and Dublin, we stick that into the general framework. Here, we use them as a case study to try to explain what has happened these past few years. I'll pass it over now to my colleague. Now, just to go back on the chronology of the uh, Galway and Dublin camps that are, are, um, are case studies. Uh, the Occupy Dame Street, which is uh, Occupy Dublin, um, was born through uh, an online campaign, just to make sure you get uh, inspired by the uh, May 15th and uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement. It was uh, put together, set up uh, on uh, October the 8th, 2011. And on uh, October the 15th, Occupy Galway was set up. Uh, it started very, very slowly. And uh, then Cork, Belfast, Limerick, and Waterford a bit later. Now, this is uh, occupied Dame Street. So in Dublin, this is important uh, because it's um, the location is important. It's strategically 
in front of the um, uh, to the central bank in Dublin, and it kind of blocked the, the, the entrance in a way. This is very symbolic. But it also show you that you're talking about a camp that is rather small. Um, we're talking uh, about, on average, 20, 30, 40 people camping uh, day in day out. Now, this is the camp in uh, Galway. This is at the end. This is probably, especially with the blue sky like that, probably April or May. So this is at the end of the movement. Uh, it's kind of protected uh, by pallets on the ground. But it started really with um, a few tents and um, the idea of uh, looking at what we're talking about, we're also going to look at who. Basically, we're talking about a group of people that are soci sociologically uh, diverse and uh, balanced. We're talking about um, almost as many women as men, and uh, a good balance in terms of age, uh, particularly in Galway. Um, in terms of age, uh, we have um, old activists uh, in Dublin who are very much uh, uh, <coughs> thinking that this movement can revive radicalism uh, in Ireland and also uh, young uh, people who have never been involved in the movement before. This is the, their, their first time and this is very important um, because it's going to politicize them. Uh, we'll see that again uh, at the end. Uh, among the, the, the older members of the Occupy Dublin um, movement, uh, a good number of them are ex-members of the party, political party, or uh, trade unions, or uh, radical associations. And they've been involved in uh, different, um, different actions, actions of protest. This is uh, very much a movement that is trying to mimic forms and rituals, as it says here, of the Occupy movement uh, in general, particularly the one in uh, the United States. So this is a leaderless movement. There is no representative as such, but at the same time, the discourse uh, very early is that they're going to develop uh, demands that are specifically Irish. So we're talking about uh, the departure of the IMF from uh, Ireland. Um, the departure of the IMF is, a, is an important symbol in terms of um, sovereignty. Uh, this is something that has a lot of resonance uh, within the Irish public. Um, uh, the notion of uh, the national question in Ireland is very, very important. So, uh, this is, in the discourse, it's the idea that uh, the IMF um, is using Ireland as a colony. Uh, this is an IMF colony or a German colony. Uh, and um, this is some, their main and, and first uh, claim. The second one is the end of the of private banks' uh, debts. Uh, this is a burden on the Irish public. This is the fact that the private banks uh, have been made public and now the public has to pay. Uh, it translates very simply in cutbacks uh, in public sector, in health, in education, as you said. Um, it translates in um, also um, extra hours uh, that are not paid or um, at the moment in Ireland there is uh, the question of a blue flu which is the police uh, uh, getting involved in work to rule uh, because they are not uh, paid um, for their extra hours. There's also a, a project at the moment um, for nurses uh, who have new um, Nurses coming to the to, to the job who have made, been made redundant to be rehired uh, at um, a low wage, 80% of their salary. Uh, there is also uh, the idea of implementation of real uh, participatory democracy. What does it mean for a, a group of uh, 30, 40 people in a camp? This is quite limited, but 
there was a workshop developed in, in Galway with the idea that uh, they should gather and try to rewrite or to write a new constitution for the country. This is a gigantic task and it never really came about. Uh, and finally, the return of oil and gas reserves. Uh, uh, the, the fact that there is a lot of um, old activists from uh, the Green Party are, are, um, is very important for this because we're talking about here uh, multinational uh, corporations who are using the oil and gas reserves uh, from Ireland that are uh, considered to be part of um, the public domain. So, uh, this is the case of uh, Shell at Sea in the north of uh, um, Ireland, uh, on the coast where Shell projects to extract oil uh, on the shore and um, people are actually protesting on site. Now, it means that the, the people involved in Occupy were also uh, taking, place, uh, taking part in those uh, actions. This is also the case for certain forms of resistance um, the blocking of roads um, and uh, the blocking of um, uh, evictions from people who have, uh, were in debts uh, in Ireland. Now, just going to have a look at my, in terms of, of reasons to mobilize, there is a lot of frustration based, of course, on the economic uh, situation, and there is personal anger that the, that the public, the general public, but in the case, the people who are uh, mobilizing um, were lied to by the government. And uh, also that they were not told at the time what it was about, and they're still not really aware of why we have uh, a situation like that. Uh, this is particularly the case that uh, at times the media were to blame. Uh, Firstly, because the movement Occupy in Ireland was not visible enough, but also because it was caricature. The idea is that the media were, in Ireland were keen to talk about Occupy in different countries, but not about Occupy in Ireland. Uh, these two pictures here, so this is not really uh, the flamenco in, in the bank, but here, this is uh, a protest. It's, they are picketing in a bank. It's interesting because this is RTE, State sponsored spin RT is like BBC in Ireland. This is the, the state broadcast, uh, broadcaster. And here, Occupy Game Street. If you don't know what's going on or what we're talking about, turn off the news. Okay? So the media are to blame. They are not passing on the message and they are uh, caricaturing um, Occupy Ireland. You should conclude that. Sorry. Yeah. Quickly enough, that I'm just going to conclude with it. Sorry about that, we're running kind of over time here. Yeah, just kind of very, very rapidly. Then, what we notice here is that Occupy in Ireland, there were an awful lot of difficulties, okay, linked to that. One of the difficulties is the fact that there was absolutely no mass participation at, at all. In some of the pictures we saw here, the fact that only 5, 10, 15 people were involved on a daily basis. First meeting, I think, was 200 people, and from then it just moved down to a few key members. Um, homeless people in many cases in Dublin and in Galway. Uh, secondly, there was also absolutely no desire in many ways, a lot of what Marcus said earlier this morning, was absolutely no desire to widen um, their own very, very uh, narrow interest. Uh, so to touch on symbols that may possibly bring about an awful lot more people involved in their own campaign. Um, there was really never about them as being champions of, of the public good. In many ways, it was very extremely low, low uh, low-key, very self uh, egotistic type of um, uh, um, movement brought about by, by, by specific people. <coughs> so, um, so why was it in, in some ways a failure? Very, very briefly, a few key points here. Um, there are very, very few people with organizational skills, very, very few people with um, experience in, in organization, there were also key strategic choices which the people made, as we saw in a lot of the other examples uh, earlier on today. Um, leaderless and so on and so forth. I'll finish on this. In, some, in many ways, uh, there was an absolute total lack of resonance with Irish political culture as such in general. 
absolutely uh, limited um, wrestlers with that. And there was a, um, well, because it was a, a lack of resonance, there was actually no feeling back from public towards support of the Occupy movement. I'll leave it at that. There's an awful lot of things I want to say about it. It went a bit too fast. Apologies. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Sorry. Thanks very much. So the story begins in Barcelona when I was at a conference in June 2011 and there was a hell of a lot of noise outside and some of my colleagues from Israel who were at the same conference went out into the street and came back with their eyes shining and said something amazing is going on here and then their faces dropped and they added this could never happen in Israel. And then, um, a month later, actually a little under a month later, on July 14th, uh, a handful of young uh, students set up a, a tent in the middle of Tel Aviv, protesting the eviction from uh, rented housing of one of the students and started an Occupy movement which peaked on 3rd of September with 300,000 people gathering in Tel Aviv and another 100,000 elsewhere in the country, uh, making this, I think, the largest per capita um, um, mass demonstration Occupy movement um, anywhere. Now, uh, this, we could spend the next 20 minutes on this. I'm just going to show you a couple of little things. Um, it's a, a table that tries to summarize some of the aspects of the Spanish 15M and side by side with parallel aspects of the Israeli 14J. Um, so I'll just run through it quickly. This is sort of the uh, size matters idea. Um, about a quarter of a million, I think, nobody seems to really know. In Israel, we have a technology which actually can establish how many people are at mass gatherings. Um, it's not even that sinister, but we can talk about that another time. And um, so this is Spain, where there were large um, mass gatherings, demonstrations, and there was also a majority, a clear majority of popular support for the indignados, as measured by opinion polls. Um, the media, however, were less uniformly supportive. Some of them were quite oppositional, and the police were uh, quite repressive. And uh, in Israel, as I've already said, the peak numbers were larger. The, pop the public support was monumental, and the media led the charge with the business media leading the campaign for um, to clean up government handling of the economy, to um, be nice to the middle class, uh, reinforce the welfare state, and all kinds of stuff. Could be an interesting topic for discussion. Um, and no police repression during those three months, or two months, of high activity. Um, so maybe I'll actually stop here with the table because the, the key point that I want to make here is that uh, coming from Barcelona back to Tel Aviv and then um, from Tel Aviv back to Spain, I'm, I'm spending the year in Bilbao to try and study the Spanish movement, I was very, very struck by this common element that these are Occupy movements which, very differently from the French and the Irish cases we've just heard about, were not confined to a band of activists sitting in a, uh, in a public square or whatever, but also included a mass movement. A mass movement that was temporary, but extremely highly mobilizing the, uh, the mass public and enjoying vast support from the mass public. And uh, so I propose to my colleagues in that we try to investigate this. So we came up with the notion that a possible subcategory 
of um, <coughs> protests could be called encompassing protests. And we have a very unrigorous um, initial definition, and I'd love to talk about this with you people who are experts on social movements, which I am not. Um, but right now we'll call it a series of mass demonstrations under common auspices. Um, reading Maria's paper, I, I encountered this notion of a campaign that may fit. And the second component being high consensus, not obviously total consensus, but operationally that would mean broad awareness, broad public awareness of the protest, majority support for the protests, and insofar as there is public opposition, limited and not fierce. Okay. This describes the Israeli case. I, I begin by saying that. And other cases which seem to fit from the Occupy type wave are the Greek and uh, Portuguese cases. And if anybody knows of any others that might come under this umbrella, I'd be very keen to know. So what is the role of this particular part of the research? We're doing other parts of it as well. A major part is, in, is looking at the economic background to the protests in the two countries. And maybe in the discussion tomorrow, I'll mention something about the findings from that. But here, in this paper, in this presentation, what we're interested in is something which doesn't seem to have been addressed at all in the social movement literature so far as I can establish. There's been a lot of interest in the interrelationship between the institutional political system and non-institutional protest politics, particularly with the very well-established idea of a political opportunity structure. But what people don't seem to have um, thought about is that if you try to launch an encompassing protest, not one based on a homogenous social group or a dedicated band of people who share a similar world view, then you're going to encounter the same political cleavages that divide the institutional political system. And that is the challenge that encompassing protests face in Israel. They faced it in a very conscious way, precisely, and in Spain as well, precisely because these are two countries in which political cleavages are extremely deep, entrenched, and fierce. So the very idea that different parts of the population, left, right, religious, secular, um, different ethnic groups, Jewish, Arab, and Israel, etc., would collaborate in a common cause um, is inconceivable. Um, and so what we then ask is whether or how social and ideological divisions, which are entrenched in institutional politics, structure the engagement of individuals and social sectors in an encompassing protest, which, of course, is a form of non-institutional politics. Why does it matter? I think for, for two main reasons. One is that this introduces, perhaps, unless you tell me it's already been done, uh, God forbid, uh, this introduces a new dependent variable, something we should be studying, encompassing protest and a new independent variable to explain why people participate in them or don't, political cleavages, but also, so far as the study of Occupy-type movements is concerned, I think as this conference shows, and understandably, there's been a tremendous amount of interest by researchers in the camps, in the occupiers, in the practices, uh, direct democracy, horizontalism, etc., but uh, it, less attention has been paid to those cases in which the movement was much broader and actually engaged large segments of the public in either passive or active support. And so <coughs> we think this is a contribution. So this research is based on analysis of public opinion polls that were carried out in um, Spain and in Israel. Um, I'm not going to go into any details, I can in Q&A, um, but the key thing was that the polls asked people two key questions. One, to what extent do you support or sympathize with the protests? Two, have you actually protested? OK, 
Okay, so we can, we can look at the passive and the active, and there's a hypothesis in the paper. It's not theoretically uh, in elaborated, but it makes some sense, which says that active support is a bolder step. Active support of a movement which may be seen to be sponsored by your enemy uh, or your rival politically or somebody you find it difficult to identify, a group you find it difficult to identify with politically is a bigger step because it's a performative action, okay? You can sit at home and be called by a pollster and be asked, you like A, B, or C, and it's a lot easier to identify than go step out on the street with a bunch of people that you wouldn't be seeing there before. Um, so, Spain and Israel are our two places in which there were encompassing protests, and also, as I already mentioned, both, both cases in which cleavages are particularly strong, okay? So, this mitigated against the emergence of an encompassing protest, and on the other hand, if you do see an encompassing protest, you might be suspicious that it's underlain by these cleavages. Still, it's kind of a contradiction, right? How do you involve, how do you engage the masses if they're not really engaged? If underneath all that, there is division. And that's essentially the name of the game of this, of this research. It's this kind of dialectic between encompassingness and division uh, that seems to characterize these movements. Um, okay, enough. So, now we get to the, to what's, what's actually analyzed in this, in this case. So the two, this is very standard kind of stuff. There's two kinds of political cleavages we look at, ideological, starting with the, the, the left-right cleavage, and <coughs> which it has a completely different meaning in both countries, one from the other, and which in both countries is somewhat different particularly in Israel, from what we might imagine left-right cleavage should be about. Right? It should be about redistribution. Okay? But in uh, Israel, it's mainly about borders, uh, what you want to do with the occupied territories, if you're in favor of state regulation and imposition of religious practices, a whole bunch of identity uh, issues, collective identity issues. It's not at all about um, classic uh, social democratic versus economic liberalism, left and right. And in Spain, it's also more complicated because left and right is a bit about the regionalism, I'll call it, problem. So you've got <coughs> ideological cleavages and you've got social cleavages. You have one common one, which is religiosity, which has been underappreciated in the Spanish case, turns out to be tremendously important for the um, support of the Indignados movement. And in Israel, you have various uh, types of ethnic cleavages, starting with the, the most important one between the one-fifth of the citizens who are Palestinian <coughs> Arabs and the four-fifths who are Jews. And then we have a bunch of control <coughs> variables, things that you might think would predict whether a person supports such a movement, such as whether they are, have a, a, an academic degree, whether they're economically vulnerable, whether they're men or women, and so forth. And then we have, more interestingly, I think, we have some, a couple of variables that might catalyze or inhibit the effects of these other variables, right? So, <coughs> for instance, in the Spanish survey, we have some questions about whether people had participated in strikes, demonstrations, and other forms of non-institutional political action in the past, and we discover that this it acts as a catalyzer for the effect of the cleavage variables. People who have participated are more likely to follow their inclinations uh, in, in support or particular <coughs> So that's the layout. So I'm just going to show you sort of some illustrations of findings, things that are in the paper, <coughs> along with a lot of other stuff. So this is the left-right cleavage, okay? It's a 10-point scale. It happened to be the same question in both, both uh, surveys in both countries, which is nice. And this is the, the proportion of people in each <laughs> country. Blue, I'm sorry, the legend isn't showing it because I had to cover it up because PowerPoint is a pain in the butt. 
Um, blue is Israel and red is Spain here. And you can see that on average, strong passive support means in Israel, it's, it's a scale in Spain, but in Israel it means you strongly support or you support. Okay? So in Israel, an average of 56, overall 56% of the people polled strongly supported. In Spain, about one-third strongly supported. But what's interesting to us here is not only the average, but also how polarized it is along left-right lines. And as you can see, the Spanish curve, the red one, is very steep, which means that people on the right were very unlikely to strongly support. People on the left were almost as likely, almost as a, getting close, as the very high proportion, 80% almost, of the Israelis who placed themselves on the Israeli left um, would have done. Now, on the one hand, it looks like, well, that's interesting. Spain is a more polarized polity than Israel. We wouldn't have thought that. But don't forget that left-right in Israel are seemingly irrelevant to the, these protests, which were about the welfare state, the economic situation of young people, the problem of getting housing, um, child care costs for young families, and the general rise in inequality and poverty. Those were the key issues that were, that were raised. And here, this is passive support. And here we have the parallel results for active participation. Again, the question which asked, did you um, participate in a demonstration, that was the Israeli one. The Spanish question was a bit broader. As you can see overall, the um, uh, Israelis were more than twice as likely to, have, to report that they had participated in a protest. And again, the left-right polarization is clear, but note, in Israel you've also got now strong left-right polarization similar to Spain i.e., the left-right cleavage is more salient to going out on the street than it is to saying, sure, sure, I'm in favor, okay? A second finding, it's exactly parallel, presented in an exactly parallel way now, was a specific question, a little different in each country, but similar enough to be comparable, asking people, do you think the government should do more to reduce inequality, okay? And if left-right is capturing that, then we should see similar results to what we <coughs> saw in the previous slide, right? And we don't. We see kind of the opposite results here, right? Here, the Israelis are deeply polarized according to their view of redistribution, and, yeah, and the Spaniards, Spaniards are not, okay? This suggests to us that left-right in Spain, is not as much as we thought it was about redistribution. And left-right in Israel is not enough about redistribution, which is what people who supported the protests were really caring about. Now I have to move very fast. So I'm going to skip that. I'll give you an example here, a nice example of one of these catalyzing forces. <coughs> This is, the, this is the effect of religiosity. So just look at the right-hand chart, because it's the strong one on particip active participation, okay? What is the likelihood of a person on the left, now divided in four categories, so that's the right-hand side of the graph, actually having joined a protest? So if you were um, um, uh, actively going to the church, or if you identify with the ch as a Catholic, but you don't go to church, those are the two bottom lines, then being left and right doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference. You're immunized. Okay. But if you are secular, then your leftism comes into, comes into play uh, very, very strongly. So that's this idea of sort of synergy between certain uh, characteristics. And we have a similar thing going on here with previous political participation which makes a tremendous difference to, and that's obvious, to whether you are, you're active or not. So you need to trace that back. Who were the ones who were actively participating? It has to do with the cleavages that we talked about earlier. And here's, here's a great one for Spain. People who identify first and foremost with their region rather than with 
the Spanish central state, were much more likely to express their left-wing tendencies, if they had them, and actively participate. Now, this to me, this is a great way to learn about Spanish politics, because I was surprised. Okay, concluding thoughts. So, <coughs> it's this dialectic that I mentioned already earlier. The key to this research, I think, is the idea that um, bringing masses of people together behind an encompassing process, protest movement means you, you must run up against political cleavages that have been institutionalized by the institutional political system, the electoral system. So there are two sides to that then, right? Two implications. One is that the, in, in any country there could be a glass ceiling for an encompassing movement which would be set by the cleavage structure. But at the same time, this is not written in stone because you have political agency. And one of the things that I don't go into in the paper, but hopefully we will do in future work, is how the activists and the leaders of these two movements actually exercised or did not exercise agency in trying to create a collective identity that would blur the cleavages and make it possible for people to collaborate under some kind of new heading. This goes back to stuff you guys were talking about, about um, <laughs> being able to motivate support in a, in a difficult context.